You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech to the Podcast. This is episode 153 called How to Build an EdTech Toolkit for Your Students. In this episode, we'll talk about how to find the EdTech tools that are best for your students when working in the classroom. In a world where there are so many choices for educational technology, it's more important than ever to help your students find the best choices possible. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. So I think it's important to say that this is our follow-up episode. If you haven't listened to episode 152, uh, we talked about building an EdTech toolkit to prepare yourself for teaching. So it's all the stuff that you do before you hand out an assignment to your students. And in this episode, we're going to follow it up with preparing your students to be successful while using EdTech to enhance what they're doing in the classroom and taking their learning to the next level. But before we get into that, let's get into some of our updates. Uh, we will be releasing the 12 days of ed tech. Uh, soon as you're listening to this episode, I guess it will be out on Monday. Uh, we'll either release them all at once or we will do one a day or a combination of both. I'm not really sure because we are busy. Crazy busy. Hopefully one a day, because I actually posted the first one yesterday, which even that I think is, is it a day late? It depends on whether we wanted to finish on the 24th or the 25th. doesn't matter. We got one up right now. I'm not even going to talk about it in this episode because um, there's so few that are actually there, so I don't want to be sending people to our YouTube channel for new videos that don't exist yet. But, um, you know, they're, they're rolling in and uh, you can expect those soon. It's, uh, it's just been a, a wild, wild week. Why has it been so busy? I don't know. We have a ton of classes in here podcasting. We have a ton of projects going on. This is the most uh, chaotic in a positive way that I've seen our space in a while. So it's, it's all good things, all good things. But we do have these videos for you. You can check them out over at our YouTube channel, which will be linked in the show notes for this. Or you could just go over to... YouTube and type in Got Tech and our channel will pop up. We'll also mention on March 12th we are going to be doing two EdTech throwdowns, one's on AI tools, the other one's on all regular EdTech tools, which you'll be able to check out in person. I think we're also going to record it and release it after the uh, conference for anyone who missed out. Every once in a while we like to release these uh, just so you can see what we kind of do at conferences. It's a uh, definitely one of our most popular presentation topics that we do so definitely check that out it's uh yeah it's very fun we get we get a lot of people that uh, go to see this particular presentation although we've been doing it for so many years I'm starting to get like I don't know if nervous is the word because I'm not nervous but I want to I don't want to disappoint people you know what I mean we've done so many versions of the throwdown there has to be repeat you know people showing up to see it, right? So there's like this pressure to present them with new things and it's gonna be a challenge. I know we're gonna be able to do it, but that's that's been weighing on my mind recently. Yeah, we do new things. Uh, more times than none, we'll have all new tools, but every once in a while we'll have a carryover because there's a big update to, a, to an EdTech tool. So I'm really pumped for that and I'm hoping that uh, we get a big crowd again this year. That would be awesome, so. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Let's get into the bulk of our episode. We really have two different segments for you today. The first one is how to, to build your EdTech toolkit for students, the things that you need to think about, and then we're going to give... Uh, examples of our tools that we select for our students and why we do it just so you can kind of get an idea of why we select certain ones 
and why we leave some off the list. Yeah, we realized in doing the last episode, 152, that um, it's not, there's sort of two different ed tech toolkits, right? Like there's the one that you would use as a teacher, and then there's this whole other set of things that you need your students to be comfortable with and you need them to use. And, and they're crazy different. The more we thought about it, we realized just how different they were. So that's why this is an entirely separate episode unto itself. And I, I believe we are gonna start off with just like some general things to think about. If you're maybe new to teaching or if you're new to technology, what do you wanna consider when bringing tools to the classroom that your students are gonna use? There will be a little overlap from last week's episode, but not too much because this is a total different use case. Uh, students, we have a lot more things that we can, that we have to think about when it comes to having them operate the ed tech. Now, we always think that students are way far technically advanced than what they actually are. They, they seem to know a lot more when it comes to the games, the video games and things like that. But when it comes to ed tech, I, I find that they don't get frustrated as easy as someone that doesn't use ed tech all the time. And the other thing is, is it's a totally different type of ed tech. So you really have to think about them. So there's four things that we kind of want you to think about before you make your ed tech toolkit for your students. The first one is functionality. Uh, functionality, we like to make categories of different types of ed tech tools. Uh, the functionality is, can be as broad or as specific as you want. Uh, some of the ones that we like to do are project creation or video or, or review, maybe a, a landing page for a portfolio, um, and then maybe some one-off tools. So there are different types of tools. There are one-off tools, so they do one specific functionality very well. And then there's tools that you might use uh, more often, such as like a... a Google for education app or something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, function, functionality is, is the first one we wanted to mention be, because of, that's like maybe the most important thing because if it's not functional in the way you need and for what you need it for, obviously it's not going to be a choice uh, that you're going to make for your, something your students are going to be familiar with. Sort of going along with that is the ability level of your students. You already talked a little bit about how you know, a, a lot of older people, teachers, adults, would assume students are these uh, digital natives is the term that we used to use like 10 years ago. Uh, but as we've talked about a lot on this podcast, that's, that's not necessarily true. They're digital natives, you know, with sho social media and posting things to a TikTok account or their Instagram account. They're digital natives with, you know, the latest PlayStation games. They're not digital natives necessarily, at least not on a large scale, with these ed tech tools. So you have to, you gotta be careful. Uh, are you gonna find kids that can sort of, I don't know, let's just choose Edpuzzle that are gonna be able to use Edpuzzle without any difficulty? It's probably a bad example because for students it's so easy, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, of course there are, but is that gonna be accessible to all of your students? Because that, that has to be true. If you're gonna have your kids get used to a certain piece of ed tech, you need to make sure that all of them can actually use it. And if they can't, then you at least need to consider different options. Um, I'll get into this more later, but one of the projects I do uh, throughout the year periodically is uh, just, you know, your typical make a poster about X. I'm trying one now that's, um, the kids have to do a lab report, but instead of a typed up thing, they have to make a, a poster, a, a lab report in the form of a poster. And, um, you know, ability is something I considered a lot. So what I mean by that is I offered Canva as like, you know, probably the best option, but I have for sure seen that there's students who get into Canva and struggle with how much there is, struggle with all of the different options. Um, I'm not gonna take, you know, an entire class period to teach them how to use Canva. I'm just gonna send them there and let the ones who can figure it out, figure it out. And then I'm gonna say, if you don't like Canva, or if you try it and it's not working for you, here's option B, whatever that is. I can't tell you what option B is yet because I haven't found it officially yet, but there will be an option B. There's even gonna be an option C, which is 
you can make me a uh, poster on a piece of paper, old school style. The point is you've always got to consider what can your students do, what can they not do, maybe, be maybe before anything else almost. Yeah, and you make a great point there. I mean, oftentimes we try to push like a Jeopardy game that's digital, but we can easily use the whiteboard and make a Jeopardy game, you know. So, and it's just going to be as as effective as the digital version. Right. Maybe some people even like that better. It's preference. So, providing your students with options is good. Really, I give them a task and. If they come up to me and say, hey, I'm really familiar with iMovie, I, can I use that for this project? I'll be like, yeah, but just know I'm not going to be able to support you on that if anything goes wrong because I don't know iMovie. But if you're comfortable with that and you're confident that you can make a project based off of iMovie, use iMovie. My goal is for you to turn in a quality project that you're passionate about. And if you're passionate about iMovie and that's going to be easier for you, who am I to say to use something different? Yeah, that would be, I didn't mention this, but you made me think of it. My option D will, is always uh, anything else, like literally whatever else that you want to use. If it's not Canva, if it's not a, a paper version, if it's not my option B choice for that poster, like you pick uh, basically what you just said. I don't care. I just need that quality, that quality product in the end. So that's worth mentioning. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, let's get into our next one, which is awareness of other ed tech. So remember, especially at the high school, you uh, each student might have up to eight teachers, maybe more, maybe less. I don't know your schedules, but they have more than one teacher. So if all the teachers are using different tools, that could get overwhelming. So that's another good reason why you should have that option where they get to choose, because maybe there's something better that they like. But think about what other teachers are using. If that, if you're very, I don't know, going back and forth between two different ed tech tools, see what other teachers are using and try to choose the one that's on, on the same path. Because if you're really having that conundrum between the two, there's probably really not much of a difference. So use something that they're going to be able to piggyback on other classes and what they use. And that's going to also increase their their productivity because they're going to not have to go search for functionality within that ed tech tool more than likely they've already got it because they use it in different uh, classrooms. Sort of related to that, uh, our number four on the list of things to think about is keeping it simple. You know, with your students, they don't, they have, these kids have a lot on their plates. And I'm talking about, you know, my experience with high school students, but this is going to extend to elementary kids too. These, these students are, are extremely busy, largely. They have, like you just pointed out, many different classes and I, I see a lot of teachers a lot of the times sort of can forget that and, and expect their students to be these experts in all these different tools without an awareness of the other ed tech that they're using in, you know, their other five academic courses that they're trying to take. So the more I can line up with other teachers, the simpler that I can make it for them, the better. A lot of the times for me, uh, I prefer, for example, things that the students don't have to sign up for. If there's not a student sign-in and they don't have to make an account, if they just click a link and they can use it, that's a tool for me because, you know, I don't want them to have to remember an extra username and an extra password. Um, I know how annoyed I get doing that and, you know, I'm an adult who's got a whole system set up for usernames and passwords. Is that 14-year-old going to have that? Maybe not, you know what I mean? You might want to help them work on that as a skill, of course, but like, maybe not, and I, I don't want to add to that. So, you know, all these little things about keeping it simple is, is really important to, to keep in mind here. Yeah, and going with that, you also have to think of the, the legal things, FERPA, COPA compliance. I mean, every time a student puts their username and connects their, their Google account or their education account to an ed tech tool, what are they using that information for? So you always have to make sure that you're checking with your school policies and, you know, if you're like our school, we have a list of uh, approved ed tech tools and a way to get ed tech tools approved uh, for use in the classroom. So uh, that's going to wrap up the things to think about segment. Uh, let's get into 
are examples, I guess, of a student ed tech toolkit. And most of these are based on productivity and, and how you could work around uh, or use these tools in a productive manner to, to fit the content needs that you're prescribing your students. So I'm just going to go over the categories and then I'll let you kick off the first one. Sure. The first category is presentations and project creation. We both felt that this was a one of the biggest categories that we're going to use it for. We always want to find ways for students to show that they know the content. Uh, the next one is video. Then we have review. So after reviewing for an assessment, and our last category is specialty list. And this is any ed tech tool that has like a one purpose type thing. You probably will only use it. It might be something that you use all the time or only once, or it could just be an option for the students. But you're going to put together this list. You might attach it to YouTube channels, uh, training guides, uh, things like that, that will help them use that ed tech tool. Yep, so those are the categories that we put together and I'll cover the tools in the first one, let's say, which was presentations and projects. So, and it's it's almost, I don't know if it's, it's silly to say these, but you'll notice the things that we've included here are um, really embrace the, uh, the keep it simple idea because you don't want to be sending kids to all these different places. So at the top of the list within this category, and honestly, probably all you need, and everybody listening to me right now should be already guessing what I'm going to share uh, because we talk about it just so much, and that is Canva. Canva's going to do all of these things, any, almost any project you can think of. The poster project that I mentioned earlier, Canva would be the choice for that. We helped somebody with a, a comic book creation project earlier this week, or last week. Canva is the best choice for that. Presentations, if you want kids to have really engaging slide decks, Canva, crazy professional. If you don't have Canva approved uh, yet at your school for the students to use, get it approved today. Email whoever you have to and make that a thing. It's free for students and teachers, and it's just, it's, it's just where you want to be for any, any sort of project that the kids are working on digitally. Um, the other thing with Canva is while it can be, it can seem complicated for people going in there, it's really not. Um, that's what's so great about it is it's, it's with just a very, very little training, you can get your students using it comfortably and producing excellent, excellent stuff. So that is at the top of the list for sure. Um, the other th thing that we listed here was, was actually Google Slides, which again, everybody knows this, but that's the type of thing you want for this student list. Google Slides can do a lot of that same stuff. If you want a poster, you can go to Google Slides and change the dimensions of the slide to be you know, 24 inches by 36 inches and make it look like a poster. And, and then they can, they can drag things, you know, images and videos and whatever else into those slides. Um, and sometimes you might prefer that, right? Maybe you don't want to get into Canva. You know that your kids are very familiar with Google. Send them to Google Slides. You're going to get some great stuff. If you're going to do that, maybe be aware of some places where they, they can pull in uh, other, you know, high quality looking templates like your, your Slides Mania or Slides Carnival. There's, there's several, of, several of them out there, and I'm sure you have your favorite. But for you know, presentations and projects, I can't think of any reason to go outside of these two tools. Um, you know, as I'm saying this, I, I actually did think of a, a third one that has kind of made a resurgence over the past couple years, and that is uh, Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I. I call it a resurgence because this was getting a lot of use uh, maybe like 10, 12 years ago, at least in our school. And then it seemed to sort of die off, but then I guess it never died off because uh, Prezi is still out there and still kicking and you can get some really crazy looking uh, animated slides in that um, website still. So if you have never checked out Prezi, give it a look. If you're like me and forgot that Prezi was a thing, give it a look. Um, it's another one that works essentially like Google Slides or PowerPoint, so you're not gonna have to provide too much training for the kids. It's likely they can just go there and, and sign in and, and use it. The one downside being, I am fairly certain they have to make an account. 
So you're going to want to get that cleared with your school's IT before you send anybody to Prezi, but it's really awesome, so worth considering as well. All right, I'm going to give a shout out to Brian Carpenter right now. Uh, he's the host of Fresh Air at Five podcast, and I know he's a big Adobe Express, and I have a question for him, and I could very easily uh, probably go and look this up. But Canva has a free for educators, uh, you know, package for the students and the teachers. Does Adobe Express have that? Part of my thing is, is they keep changing their name. I feel like so much that I'm not sure what's what. But is there a basic uh, editing, like infographics, that type of project maker that is free for staff, students, educators, that type of thing? Because uh, if there is, I think I'm going to go play with it and maybe see if that's another option that we could bring to our students here because if I know Adobe has so many different products out there but if they have one that is has less of a user face I guess your interface dashboard where there's so many things right if it's just that creation piece one thing that it does really really well that might be better for some of our students and some of our special ed students who get overwhelmed by that dashboard. So I'd be interested to try it out. I'm just throwing that out there to, to Brian to see if uh, he has any info on that and what his experience uh, with Adobe Express with students uh, is, you know, is it, do they find that to be very, very easy? And I know he messed around with Canva as well. So I'm interested to kind of follow up and see what his uh, take on the Canva versus Adobe, not so much in functionality, but in y interface and, and how easy it is to use. That might, maybe that's my option B that I'm looking for. I, as you were saying, Adobe kind of just jogged my memory of that episode and also made me realize that I, I too never really fully explored Adobe Express and that's because I'm just so rooted in Canva now, but it's, it's worth taking a look at for sure. Um, so that, that's what we had for presentations and projects. The next area was video. Video projects are always fun. They never get old because the, the kids just have a good time with it. They can be creative and, and, and just sort of, you know, run with it and, and make the video that they want to make within the confines of your project. If you're going to be doing that type of thing, of course, you're going to need some type of editing tool and WeVideo is the, the go-to. You will likely want to get the paid for version. There is a, there is a free that you can use, but it's it's super limited, so many minutes a month and it's it's very small. So if it's a small scale video project, you might be able to use it. We're lucky enough to get that paid for by our district. Um, but if you're not, it's worth looking into. There's And there's lots of these out there. If you just go to Google and type in free online video editor, you'll find lots of great ones. Uh, my, you know, my second favorite choice is called Screen Pal. Uh, formerly Screencast-O-Matic. We mention it all the time to the point where I don't think we need to say much else about it. Uh, but with ScreenPal, uh, it's kind of like a Screencastify alternative if you want to think about it that way. There is some editing tools. There is no limit in the number of videos you can use on their free version. Really, really excellent. And they also have a, um, a Chrome extension which integrates really nicely, so check it out. And then we dusted off this one too. Uh, from some of our older episodes. If you want to change up that video project and do something interesting, you can think about all kinds of stuff like using a, a, a green screen or you know removing the background of the video with the color keying technology, which we video can do, by the way. Um, you can also do something a little more creative like do a stop motion video. And there's a really great app for that called Stop Motion Studio. You can download it on um, you know really any uh, any smartphone that you've got, it's really fun, um, and it gets the kids doing something a little bit different than just go record yourself doing X or make a you know make a screencast of you explaining X. Those things are, you know, really valuable. But the stop motion project is like a fun way to to change that up. So those are the things that we thought of under the video category. Yeah, I like all these tools. I use all of them. Uh, whether it's for my classroom or for PD videos or whatever it may be. I'm going to tell you this right now. ScreenPal is by far my favorite in this category. Right. Uh, we Video, I think, uh, has a little bit of... They changed their interface, and I think they really need to figure that out a little bit as far as the 
ability to share uh, projects versus classroom versus just individuals that want to work with other individuals and things like that. I find it to be, uh, you know, a little tougher to navigate through than some of the other uh, tools on this list. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing we video will get there. They're making some awesome improvements, but uh, like I said, I just hope the flow is a little bit better in the future uh, there. The next category is review, and more so now after COVID than before, students want to make their own reviews. So why not give them that opportunity if they want to? So send them over to quizzes. They could make their own quizzes, or they could go review others that are already made out there. And I think that's a powerful way to learn. And with all the AI stuff that quizzes is doing, it's it's going to be hard to kick me away from them. I just find that to be uh, the tool of choice for assessments and really you could throw that into the presentations uh, spot now too since they have the, the lesson function. So I would throw that in there. Others are Quizalize, GimKit, Kahoot, uh, Book Widgets I think is another one. What are some of the other ones that we talk about? I, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of them There's for so this many. category but right now like I said, quizzes is doing so many amazing things. I probably won't stray away from too far away from that. And all the different activities that you could do within quizzes make it seem like it's not the same platform. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we listed two here: quizzes and, and GimKit, because as of right now, in December 2023, those are the the two at our school that the high school students seem to prefer the most, use the most, enjoy the most. Um, and I'm saying that out of a direct conversation I heard two kids having last week, literally about what we're talking about, which is they, they like these things. They want to be able to, you know, as an option, open up a, a, a quizzes quiz as a way to study for a test. I'm trying to give them that. Um, you know, it's, a, it's become really low on the work intensity for me because all I have to do is go to my Google Drive and use the, the quizzes Chrome extension which automatically takes all of the information on a web page and turns it into a quiz for me. It picks the right answers for me. It does everything for me. So with no extra effort at all, I can convert the study guides I already have into quizzes. You could do that with your tests as well. If you want to just like have quizzes make uh, questions from the test, you could, you could do that. Um, so I highly recommend the quiz is extension and it's possible these other gamification apps have the same. I would imagine if they don't have it, they're trying to get it because that's such a huge thing to have. But um, at least that's why we put those two on the list because they seem to be the two most popular right now. Our last category is really a list. I mean, it's a specialty list. These are the things, these are the ed tech tools or platforms that you use throughout the year or the option. It kind of is a list by functionality. You, you make this list, you have a hyperlink to the product, and you give a little description next to it. And if uh, students are looking to use a different type of tool and you wanna offer them that, you can do that via this list. So I'm gonna go down the list, or maybe we'll do like every other, and we'll just say the functionality of it, give you a couple of examples of why we uh, put these on here. So the first one is an extension. This is one used by math and science a lot. It's called Equatio. It's an equation editor and I mean the functionality is, is if you're in a Google document and you want to add a chemistry or math formula with the exponents and all that stuff, if you have this extension you could click on a microphone button say A squared plus B squared equals C squared and it's going to give you that in an image uh, version. All right, so you'll have an image, you'll plop it right into your Google Doc and you're on your way. It looks nice and it does the job very, very well and it takes a lot less time than some of the other equation editors that, that you will see online. <clears throat> yeah, math and science teachers, you gotta be using Equatio, at least if you want, if you want your students producing, uh, you know, typed out math that looks professional in the easiest way possible. So I love it. Next up is something called Fig Jam by Figma. Um, I'm very excited about this, and the more I look into it, the more excited I get. This is essentially a digital whiteboard space. 
And I know a lot of people are like, okay, yeah, like whatever. I, that's not a, a need that I have. Um, you know, if you're doing any kind of tutoring, um, tutoring over Zoom, if you are doing any sort of brainstorming where kids are working in small groups and you want to see what their, their ideas, if you're working in, in a large group and you want a place to, you know, have the discussion take place, like an online discussion board almost, it's, it's just really, really cool. Um, actually, the first 12 days of EdTech video that we put up that is posted now was, is on FigJam. It's so great. I love it. It's like an infinite space where you can just add all these different things. Some of the cool stuff about it is they have all these like widgets you can put in there that's beyond just like sticky notes or handwriting. Uh, one of them they, I was playing with it yesterday. It's called Photo Booth. So you, you add the Photo Booth widget and it puts like an image of this old school Polaroid camera. And then anybody who's on that particular board, they, they click the, the camera button like they're going to take a picture and it takes their picture and then it puts like an image of them through their computer's webcam on the board. It's silly, it's fun, but like how cool is that as maybe a space to have your students introduce themselves on day one or to do, you know, maybe as a way to take pictures of something they're, they're working on and, and put it there. And there's tons of stuff like that. The other reason this came up is as a replacer for Jamboard. Google's Jamboard going away in 2024 and we're trying to find replacements for that and I think FigJam may be, may be one of those. So I added it to the list today because I am a huge fan as of right now. All right, the next one is called Trello. It's just a way to manage a project. Uh, it allows you, it integrates with uh, the Google products. So it's very easy to keep everything there. There's a way to communicate whether you're in the classroom, out of the classroom, you could color code and label things. So Trello is another one. Uh, we have two that are very similar but different. Uh, the Noun Project, it allows you to get icons very easily, make copies of them, use them in PowerPoints or wherever you want. Obviously, if the students are working in Canva, you probably won't need this, but if you're using uh, Google Slides, this would be amazing, along with the next one, Text Giraffe. Uh, you can type in any word or whatever you want to do, and it's going to make letters out of pictures. So text giraffe, if you, if, if you type it, it's going to give you 3,000 options of color combinations, bubble letters, this, that, and all that. So those two are awesome uh, for Google Slides usage. You could probably do the next two in because they're kind of similar as well. Yeah, so, you know, these are more for your science and math people. FET, if you're a science teacher, even math teacher, there's lots of great math simulations there now too. Uh, FET by the University of Colorado is amazing for online simulations. I don't really need to explain that too much because chances are if you teach those subjects, you already know about it. But, of course, they're always innovating and adding new things and making them better. Uh, Khan Academy is, is huge for me. Um, at the high school level, students know about this and use it because of how extensive their video catalog is. They are also building in AI. One of their newer things is an AI tutor. So besides just the, the classic Khan Academy YouTube videos, they have their own AI tutor. Um, I think you have to pay for it now. I'm not quite sure where that's at. If, it, if it's even up, I know it was in like a beta version, but this means if you watch one of their videos, the, the AI tutor will then ask you questions and you answer and it responds with new questions based on your answer and whether you got it wrong or right or even parts of your answer that were correct but other parts that were wrong. It's going to be able to identify that and you know, to me that, that sounds like the future of a, a really huge space. So don't forget about Khan Academy. It definitely deserves to be on your, your students at Tech Toolkit list. Yeah, and this could be any YouTube channel. Right. Or any resource that they might use over and over and over again. Or it could be a collection of resources like Graph a Day or Topic a Day. There's different websites out there that could help with that. Uh, the next one's called Noodle Tools. This is an awesome, simple to use uh, research tool. So it's going to connect to your databases. You're easily going to be able to make works cited and things like that. You can digitally have your students prepare themselves for writing a paper and then print everything out so they can uh, easily look at it while they are typing the paper. And then when you're done with all, 
all of your specialty list or this whole ed tech list, all the categories, you could put it into Wakelet and make a collection of all the ed tech tools there. So these are just a couple that we went over uh, that we wanted to share with you, but this is an example of an ed tech toolkit. It's very simple. Uh, the functionality of everything is, is basically thought out. This is something that you don't really want to grow and develop too much throughout the year. Uh, you might add a tool here or there, but for the most part, you should go into the year with a game plan, ready to go, which ones that you're going to include into your curriculum. But That's going to wrap up this episode. Uh, Please, if you like our content, go over to Apple Podcasts, give us a ratings and a review. You can find us anywhere, Spotify, Stitcher, all that. You can go to YouTube. We have our YouTube channel linked a couple spots in this episode, but you can go over to YouTube, type in Got Tech, and you'll be able to find us. We have Twitter pages at Nick Got Tech, Guys Got Tech, and at We Got Tech for the podcast. We have a Facebook page that is up and running, and uh, yeah, we're... We're a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network, where you can find a bunch of educator podcasts uh, with a lot of amazingly talented educators out there sharing best practices and everything. So go over to teachbetter.com and uh, check those out as well. Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geist and I individually at Geist Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.